Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Lisa J. Uh, welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Uh, this is, we are in season three, our first few episodes of season three, and we're doing something a little bit different, back by popular popular demand part one part two of the uh, her shows were so successful around the world we had to bring her back on for part three potentially part four we're not sure how long this interview is going to be yet but part three i want to welcome lisa J to the episode once again lisa thank you for doing this <laughs> Oh, Chris Brown, thank you for having me, Christopher. Seriously, shout out Saudi Arabia. <laughs> we were just talking before the interview of all the countries her episodes were listened to. It were and Saudi Arabia, Japan, Austria, Finland, Peru, Indonesia, India, Republic of Korea, France, Belgium, Canada, United States. And she has to shout out to the Saudi Arabia. And the Republic of Korea. And listen, you know, I'm all about that ethnic vibe. It's my it's my peeps coming through. What's up? You know, I'm all about the, all the colors of the rainbow. How have you been? Well, I have been great. It's been uh, a good few months since we've last chatted. We've chatted back and forth on social media. And yeah. I, I, because your shows did so well, I realized we didn't really scratch the surface of who Lisa J is. So I'm okay. so excited that you just, you wanted to come back on the show. I'm so excited that people, uh, gravitated towards your episode. So we have so much we want to talk about because we, like I said, we didn't even scratch the surface, but I've been doing good. How about yourself? We are recording this in X month. I'm not sure what month is right now because it seems like everything's going on, but how have you been? Everything's good. I mean, like, listen, like it hasn't been okay with the lockdown and everything. And you know how Ontario is like, everything's locked down, but the playgrounds are like, you know, so just escaping once in a while. And it's something that you have created here on this platform. And that's why I wanted to come back. And I was bugging Chris guys, whoever's listening. Um, I was like, can I come back and just talk with you? Cause you just like so easy to talk to. And I just wanted to give a shout out to everybody who took the time to listen. Cause God knows I can talk a lot. <laughs> And it was a long one. So thank you, everybody who like took interest in me and stuff like that. And I hope to deliver the goods on this episode. Well, I think, I, you know what? Maybe they like to know the insides and outsides because I was given some tea. That's what, and that is why we do this show to spill the tea mm. without spilling the tea because I know that's trademarked by RuPaul. So we are spilling is it the now? probably that's her podcast show. RuPaul, if you want to come on the show, come on. You know, we've had people from Sherman Oaks listen to the show, so it's her. I'm guaranteeing RuPaul. it's her. Seriously, I love RuPaul. I've loved her since like you better work. Like a girl. Mm -mm -mm. I wanted to be on Drag You so bad, but I never had guts to yeah. apply. I, I, I just, I just wouldn't look good in a dress. <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved Drag You. I loved it. Oh, can I say something? Remember how we were talking about RuPaul's Drag Races and our queens and everything? Can we just take a moment to like, ah, I might get the clamp um, to give love to Chi Chi Devane. Chi Chi Devane left us. Oh, Chichi, Ontario fame. Yes. Rest your soul. Chichi Devane was from, she's from the Louisiana and she was on RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh. And she hit me different because she was talking about how she used to be like a thug and like gangsters because like people in her neighborhood never made it out. So I resonated with that a lot. And then she found drag. And after like I did my growing up and everything, I found theater and how she talks about drag is how I talk about theater, how it saved my life and like spoken word and stuff like that. The arts basically. And then she developed uh, ankylosis spondylitis. And that is the most painful form of rheumatoid rheumatism, inflammation in the body. And you know what? She was still performing and she passed on um, quite recently. I don't even know if it's been a year or so yet. And then Lady Red from Hey Queen. So I just wanted to just say that's what's been up. God, I'm well, all over the place. Hey, that's the great thing about this show. It's just two people <sighs> chatting. But I, I, I gravitate towards what you just said there. Arts is mm -hmm. such a unique entity that 
it makes allows people to express themselves however which way they want to and uh uh you through theater through your voice acting through your spoken word poetry you've been able to gravitate towards so many outlets for arts how let's let's talk about your theater days because we talked about the voice acting in part one and two of the episode but your theater days theater is a big part of your life and why is that huge Mm. um i think that i think it comes back to my first job i ever had was in theater and that's literally where i learned to act i learned um and i was five uh, or six five or six i was in grade one um, and it was for Mordecai Rickler's. It was at the Young People's Theater. And my God, I was treated like an adult. Like I had to have my my stuff together. Like one time I was like, that's how I, I think that's why when I moved into Stella Adler's in uh, New York and then I was in LA, I think that's why I'm such a hard ass. Like people were just, would always be like poking fun at how like, how much I got stuff done. Like my nickname was the screw because I just screwed everything into place. <clears throat> but that is where I think my love of theater develops because I, you're this young, like five-year-old kid, you have no concept of time. And so for me, those maybe eight weeks seemed like forever. And I learned I was, I would just wander because, you know, in between rehearsals and I got to know the props department. I got to know, my favorite was the props and then the makeup and the costumes, right? Now, what was it about the theater that drew you though? Was it the constant, every night someone's different watching your show? I think so. So like, as a kid, I don't know why it was as a kid, it was the feeling I got. And I think just, again, like putting smiles on people's faces, I think that really meant a lot to me. Um, but as, so let's flash forward to like when I was older, I think it's like as an adult, I think there was more acceptance. And I think that's what really sealed the deal with me. I think that's why I really enjoyed theater. I remember I went to Stella Adler's before my theater career took off. Okay. I was like this scared, rejected girl from Toronto. Right. Who was told, don't, don't keep acting. You're going to get rejected. And I believed it. And I still kind of believe it to this day. And then I told you in the last interview, like, okay, if I was going to advocate for people with disabilities in the mainstream media I better be the best at my game so then I went to get training and Stella's so then let's fast forward just oh my god it's so convoluted I'm so sorry so I went to Los Angeles and I started training so here I am this like rejected girl trying to get an education at like 28 years old right and um I remember John Jack he's just like I was like but I'm disabled like in my interview to see if they were going to accept me or not. And he's like, Lisa, we have a teacher here who is in a wheelchair. He's like, movement is the perception in your mind and what you do with it and what you do with that character. And I was like, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. And from there, I got my education and I was treated like an individual with their own skill sets. And I think that's what sealed the deal with me in theater because in theater it's not so much like how you look uh who your connections are it's if you can perform it's if you can deliver yeah i just answered my own question sorry it took me like 25 minutes but that is really what sealed the deal for me well and i i think you've brought up a good point because we saw i think it was last year or the year before uh the tonys uh they actually had a winner who was in a wheelchair i forget her name right now i apologize yeah. to my listeners if you want to send me hate mail send it to me cross border photography at gmail.com but she was nominated and she played a role in oklahoma she won for the tony and she was in a wheelchair because disability in theater does it means nothing now right I, I, you would think that like if anything and exactly and if anything it meant like 
I would think that it would mean more in theater because it's like, it's live and you can't do this and you can't do that. But it was like, I met the best people in Los Angeles and New York and they, they the, the directors and the producers had to reassure me. They're like, no, we're just going to make it work. And I think that is why I love the theater because they are so open and accepting and welcoming and avant-garde. <clears throat> and if you do have the goods, you're going to get cast. They're You're also very good at like correct. colorblind, you know, being colorblind and everything. And so that's another thing. So, um, Your career in theater started at a very young age, as we've already talked about. Um, you have seen, uh, and, I, and I don't want to assume here because you should never assume anything, but you have probably seen the good, the bad and the ugly of theater behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Um, one area that I want to talk about, because I know you have an amazing story and you, you sent it to me is at a young age, you learned the stage mother persona mm. from others. Mm. Um, we talked about in uh, episode uh, part one of our show with you, uh, your mother was very, let's put it hands off, putting you on the TTC at a very young age to go to school. <laughs> So I'm assuming your mother wasn't a stage mother compared to other mothers that you were interacting with. <laughs> she was never there. I'd be lucky if I could get a ride. Hey, mom, can you drive me to work so I could pay my bills? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> you take taxi. I was like, well, how do I get to the Royal? Where were we? It was for this um, big, huge company convention. I, I was like, this is an act. And they're like, yes, it is. It's an acting job. And I was like, okay. So they hired this dancing company and then they outsourced like three other like random actors. And they did like this cattle call. And I happened because of my dance background, I happened to dance my way and sing my way through this audition. And I got cast. I was 11, 12. Hmm. And no, my mom was nowhere because she's a single mother of like three kids and she ran a babysitting service. Like, you know what I mean? Um, and so she's like, you want to do this. You want to skip school. You go get there yourself. So on this set, I don't know. I walked in with a hot chocolate and like that from that moment on, one of the stage mothers is like she brought in coffee. <laughs> She brought in coffee. She's only 10 or 11. What is this? And then they're like, Lisa, are you drinking coffee? And I was just like, it was seven in the morning. And I guess I was just like, no, it's not coffee. And, but I guess like my reaction, I didn't give them what kind of a reaction they want. So in the group, when we were all called to group and we did our first rehearsal, we got notes. They literally all ganged up on me. They all really? ganged up. On me. Yeah, they were sitting on the opposite side. And how I figured it out is because there's like, there's this lovely little girl and she was part of their dance troupe. And she's like, all of the mothers are talking about you. I was like, why? <laughs> why? You're a mother, man. You're an adult. And you're here to chaperone your kid. And the example you're setting is to talk shit about another kid. Like, come on. Do you think, me. do you think, and I, we're going to dive a little bit uh, deeper into this episode here. Do you think your mother not being there all the time made you a better performer because you didn't have the quote unquote helicopter parent over top of you always critiquing you? Because that's the biggest critique that I see on those like uh, pageant shows with little kids and their helicopter parents is they're always critiquing the child. So do you think your mother not being there actually benefited you? Absolutely. Really? I think my mom was way, yes, I do. And I mean, yes, I was in a lot of precarious positions at like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 movie sets and stuff like that. And there's things that I could say, but I would go off the record because loose lips think ships. <clears throat> but are you kidding me? What are you going to do? You're going to bring your mommy to work with you every fucking day for the rest of your life. So I'm glad that I, I grew up the way I grew up. You know, maybe tough, maybe tough. Because but then from, in some ways, it also made me so weak. I think so? it because you wanted that nurturing, and then you're going to get that nurturing from wherever you can take it. And sometimes, wherever you can take it, 
those people are not so genuine. Not always so out for all the of the, issue. Yeah. Yeah. So all of the growing up I did was literally either on my own or um, my mom and I having our rare moments where she actually, you know, wasn't busy or distracted or disinterested or resentful that she heard she didn't have a normal daughter <clears throat> to even talk through it. And she taught me a lot, but then, or I'm telling you, it's the one or two either black Melanesian, I call them Melanesian because they're not black. There's so many, so many, we're called Asian, y'all called Caucasian. So uh, Melanesian or gays took me under their wing. And in, yeah, or in that sense, or in that instance, there was this gorgeous um, black woman. She was the only, and get this, she was the only mother out of those, all those stage moms who was like, would make me laugh. And oh. she took my mind off of it. And guess what? All those other stage mothers hated her as well. You know what I'm saying? So I learned very much like who to gravitate to. And that's why I I, I think like, I don't know. I like the oddballs. I'm gravitated to the oddballs because they're safer to me. We, we certainly are. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. During that time, though, because this is this is the part where I find it interesting. You talk about yeah, how because I want to help other people out there by any we, chance. We, yeah. we are. You talk about how the stage mother looked down on you. Hey, you're not with your mother. Hey, you brought in a coffee, yeah. even though it's hot chocolate. How yes. were the how were the their children? Were they supportive of you? Were they friendly to you? Or was it, is it, and I hate to use this word, but like mother, like daughter, or like father, like daughter, or like father, like son, mother, like son, yeah. were the kids emulating what the parents were doing as a stage mother and saying, oh, well, if my mom doesn't like this one, I can't like this child either. Yeah, you hit it right on the nail. We all shared a dressing room, the girls at least, right? Yeah. But here's, and here's the thing. <clears throat> this was before I decided to go into theater. This was still when I was getting my rare TV days because the arthritis hadn't crippled my body so bad. The director loved me. So that was my saving grace. And always, always, always in this industry, if you, if you are valuable, your ass like is going to be protected. Do you know what I mean? And so he got dragged into it by these, like magpies over a gosh darn hot chocolate. The kids were like starting to like, they would all hang out in one corner backstage. And then it would just me be me, the Melanesian mother, her son, who was my dancing partner. You know what I mean? And I, one thing my mother told me is like, never kick up dust on set. There's just not enough time and there's not enough money. You know what I mean? To like, and you're not a star. Like, who do you think you are? So never, so I was quiet. I went in. I did my work. They dragged the director into it. And he's like, you're fine. That helped them back off a little bit. But yeah, the, some of the kids were just like mom, just like daughter. But at the end of it, when we racked and everything, and I was going to the subway to take my ass home at museum, <clears throat> museum station in, in Toronto, one of the meanest of them came and wrapped her arms around me. Do you know really? what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a twisted, twisted world. Is it the, uh, hey, I'm I'm no longer with, it's sort of the mean girl effect? You're not with the- Yeah, it was or? totally the mean girl. It was like Gretchen coming like, oh, I feel bad. I don't want to be a jerk here. But I was like too little too late. And I just like pushed her away. I was like, I've got a train to catch. So Literally. how did that change you? How did that change you into realizing what bad part, the bad parts of theater is into mm -hmm. going forward into your next job, your next audition, because you're, you're up. Okay. Go, go continue. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm up. I'm up. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say one of my, the thing that I want to know is how did the experience of that stage mother atmosphere that you got and you weren't really part of, change you into a better actor for future performances because if you go into the next performance and you see a kid getting picked on from another stage mother do you gravitate towards that person who's getting picked on and say you know what 
just ignore that that stage mother she's she's she doesn't know you she doesn't respect you you have to respect yourself did that happen what happened in me is i said to myself i would never make anybody feel like that again and i would i i would stick up especially a child against an adult like look at the physical difference do you know what i mean and then you're teaming up in numbers you know what I'm saying? And um, it changed me in a sense that also it did make me gravitate towards more to be like a vigilante. And that also you got to be careful with that, because sometimes when people get picked on, there is a reason they get picked on. Do you know what I mean? So you really have to navigate. You really have to navigate and know how to like size people up. My best advice if you're a kid is like, go and do your job, do it right be the best you can be at your work and bounce out and don't get too personal. And if I could go back, <clears throat> I don't think I would have changed a thing because I think at the end of the day, one of them at least learned something about herself. Otherwise she would not have approached me at the end of the day and tried to like reconcile with me and hug me and, you know, like get out of here. Did you follow any of their careers? Any of the, any of the girls that used to pick on you uh, when you were doing this and you go, Oh, you, maybe you they like that like was that. your. Like, so many, they've lived to like have so many regrets and you know what I mean? I've had yeah. so many people come up to me in like later years going, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm like, that's cool. You never affected me. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, but it's, well, it's just good like, that it can roll off your back because you, you, there's not a lot of people who can let that go. Right. So no, to you to okay. have to be a strong person who can roll off your back. Okay. So get this though. Like I did cry. Like I would go into the closets and I would cry a lot. Like on that, especially like, I remember when the girl came up to me and she said, um, cause you know, you get picked on at school as well. Right. And so, um, she's like, she came up and she told me, and she's such a sweetheart. Um, and she's like, everybody's talking about you. Everybody is like saying that they hate you. And you're like such a bitch and this and that. And I was like, why? And they're like, cause you brought in coffee and you didn't want to talk about it. And I could feel that as I was like, like, who was it? What are they saying? I wanted every single detail. I could feel in my chest, like my heart going up to my throat. Like I was just fighting back tears. Like, and there was times that I did cry. And then one of the actresses, oh my God, one of the actresses. So she was there and she like, you know, it all went down in that one big green room and everything. And then I took off and I was crying. I remember it was in a stair, stairwell, but I would not give these bitches the credit to cry in front of them. So I went somewhere else and I cried. And then she came up to me and I thought like, oh my God, here we go again. And she's like, no, no, no. She's like, I want you to know. Oh my God, I might get <clears throat> choked up. And she's like, I want you to know you're doing an excellent job and just don't listen to them. Do you know what I mean? One of them was even another actress. Wow. Like another adult actress. And, and I tried to give her a compliment. I think I was like, oh yeah, I've seen you in Lincoln. She was a, she was an actress and a dancer in Lincoln. And she just looked at me with the dirtiest look, but I've never like seen her since. But who I did see was that one woman, that one female actress. And I said, Hey, do you remember doing this job? She's like, yes. I didn't know if you would remember. I was like, I just want to say, thank you. You're the only reason why I held it together. And the director and that one, I forgot her mother, the one Melanesian mother. And so thank you. And so I promised myself that that was the kind of actress I was going to be. Now, if you talk to anybody that I produce for, they'll be like, no, Lisa's not like that. She's so serious and she's such a bitch. So I've got different facets to me. I wear different hats at different times. You, your career, like we said, we started quite young. Um, you worked in downtown Toronto. What were some of the performances that you can remember that you were like, you know what? I knocked that performance in theater out of the park. It wasn't so much my, my, I think Jacob Tutu in the hooded bang I did. I got a really great review. I still have it. And it's like a lovely little Lisa Yamanaka <laughs> at the time. Yeah. I was like, it's Jay bitch. No. Um, <laughs> um, Even that then thrown was, the shade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even that I was throwing the shade. Um, that one was good. The one where I got bullied that I just talked to you 
Um, I still performed the crap out of it. What was um, the name of the production for that one, if you don't mind me asking? God, he came from, he, his name was Bill. He's this famous, like, uh, theater director. He came, they brought him in from the States. We Massey Hall. No, it wasn't at Massey Hall. It was at, ah, uh, you would think I would be more prepared for this. I had this moment in our last interview where I was like, oh, I'm not prepared at all. His name was Bill something. I'll, when this episode comes out, I'll probably tweet it below. But there he's such go. a sweet yeah, I'll do that. Um, but it was for a toy company. It was for a major American toy company and they were having a convention. And our job was like to dance and highlight for all the toys. So I knocked that out of the park, regardless of how angry and upset I was. And then um, my CBC days, like my CBC radio theater days, I got yeah. a couple of letters. Yeah. And I want to talk about that because that is so different from actual live theater. I'm assuming yeah, like take totally. me through what a CBC radio theater production is <gasps> like, because I don't think a lot of people would know for my listeners internationally. <laughs> yes. What a CBC radio theater would be all about. Okay. So CBC is kind of like our BBC, yeah. you know, and, and they have a radio, they have a radio side to it. And I, and I got this. Oh, I love it. Okay, so I'll walk you through it. I don't really, I, I guess I auditioned for it or something. But at that time, I was doing a bar. So, you know, CBC, it was airing on CBC, the cartoon. And so I guess they knew my voice from that. And so I got this epic role. It was the role of a lifetime. And it was about this little girl who's trying to go back and find her grandmother's house. Now, if you ask me, who directed, who wrote it. I'm so sorry to be so disrespectful. I can't remember back then. Um, I know the director for that one was, his name was Barry. And um, so I, you'd, you get mailed the script and it's like these super long, it's like legal sized scripts. And they were on this crisp white paper. It was just like 52 pages of dialogue. And then you go in and you have rehearsals in front of a mic and you learn how to hold your pages so that they don't ruffle in your takes and everything. And then you record it there. You get a few takes and you sit down and you have a table read. That's how I learned how to do my table reads. And it was all um, in their old building on 52 John Street, I think. Oh, wow. And that building. Yeah, it was so I think you would love it, Chris. It was such a beautiful building and they had a cafeteria downstairs and it was just very no frills you know so and this wasn't was, live right this was this was live to no, tape was or not, was this tape this was taped so this was not live theater but it was radio theater so you would still use the skills that you do in live theater but it's recorded you've got a couple more shots like it's like radio was it a big transition for yourself going from theater into the radio theater or was it an easy yes. transition such a good question so yes um you know, you have to learn to be quiet, but even in theater, you have to learn to be quiet. But like, this is like, you have to be like microscopically quiet. Like because I'm assuming be everyone's in the same room while they're recording yes. everyone's line. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so for this one in, in CBC at 52 John, they had one tiny booth that was completely soundproof and maybe one, two, we had like four people in there, max once. Wow. Um, and you would do your solo lines because it was completely soundproof and like the sound quality was just so rich, you know? And then when you had your big ensembles, so you would have all of like your cast out when we're doing these big, long interactive scenes. It was such a beautiful, like, I wish they would do a documentary on it because visually I remember being this kid and there would be like a half circle of like artists there moving into the mic and then moving out. And you have to like kind of grow a sixth sense really and become intuitive because you have to be aware of somebody's body. Cause if you brush up on their body, it'll make noise. You have to hold your paper. You have to grow eyes on the back of your head, you know? So yeah, it was really, really interesting. Um, did you enjoy yeah. it the first time you did it though? Or was it harder was to pick so up than nervous. going live? 
No, I think I was so nervous. I'm more nervous doing radio, I think. I think I'm so, I was so nervous doing live theater, but the thing is it was easy for me because I was singing and dancing, except for um, one time I, no, there was two days in a row and I guess I was distracted. Either I was stressed out by just like the ordinary things of being a kid, but I remember I lost, I forgot my lines twice in one night. And they even said to me, they're like, we'll give, we're going to give the line to somebody else. And I was like, no, please don't give the line to somebody else. And I got it together. But for some reason I was really distracted. Um, Because that would be the hardest part in my opinion, because for a live production, it's, it's, hit or miss you you don't get a read so right? yeah mm-hmm. and to be at a young age and having a hit and miss opportunity like that must be scary as shit pardon my french no but, it's okay but to do it and then a flub it twice in one night <gasps> like do you just then think to yourself okay i'm done like there no one's gonna hire me after they learned that this happened yeah and i think that there are like lasting effects that can grow into adulthood and I think that is why I'm a highly nervous person I am an overly sensitive person because from a long like for a young young age or a highly critical of myself um but yeah it is it is nerve-wracking because you don't know you're not going to get another shot at it and if you goof up you better pray that your castmates will jump in like they did for me and they did wow Mm-hmm. Going back to the CBC radio part of this, uh, the story, um, you, you record your lines, you get the date of when it's going to be airing. What do you do? Do you get all your friends over and sit around the old, the old hi-fi and listen to it like <laughs> 1920s or how do you do this? Get in the car and drive around, listen to your audition. How, how did, how, when you, when the first time you heard yourself on CBC radio live theater, what was the experience like? You know what? For that one where I was on my way to grandma's house, I don't think I ever really, I don't think I remember hearing it. I think maybe I was sent a tape or something, but I don't think I, I sat up. No, there was no like listening party. No, <laughs> sorry to burst your bubble, but there was like no <laughs> listening party. Um, it's like, yeah, I came out. <laughs> congratulations but I got the nicest piece of mail from a man to this day and he's like my daughter really really loved that um episode so she had a listening party (laughs) but I didn't she did I was kind of lost and I didn't know what was happening (laughs) I know I was forgetting Um, my life your journey from Toronto takes you to I don't want to just correct me if I'm wrong here takes you to New York or takes you to LA first Takes me Ellen, to New York. Takes you to New York. The epicenter of live theater. The, oh, God, The yeah. epitome of all things theater. You are now in the central hub oh, of man. theater. Walking oh, off yeah. the plane, walking off the, uh, getting out of the car the first time in downtown New York as a theater nerd. I'm going to yeah. call you a nerd for this experience. I am. How was that to see Broadway for the first time? <sighs> Ugh, New York, New York. Um, it was right after 9-11. It was the summer after 9-11. Yeah. Wow. And I and and so I don't know what propelled me. Oh, yeah. Everything in our last episode propelled me to take me to New York. Really good bridge. Um from the last Ooh. episode. To- <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm in New York and whatever led me led me there. And it was amazing. Oh my God. I had um, an apartment just over the Brooklyn bridge. So I lived in Riverdale or yeah, Riverdale, Brooklyn. And it was amazing. Um, I met one of my best friends there, a couple of my best friends to this day. And that's where I realized like, I suck. I suck at acting. <laughs> well, that's and that's so what and I learned. Well, and that's what I want to know, because no disrespect to the Toronto theater scene. No disrespect at all. No, of course New not. York theater scene is a lion of a beast, I'm assuming, compared to anywhere else in the world. So you are getting off the plane relatively new to New York and you are auditioning for roles. 
in New York. How was the experience so much different or equal to your experience, uh, your audition experiences in Toronto? Well, I didn't really have any experiences in Toronto because I was a write-off. Ah, okay. So this is why I went and studied at the best. I was like, all right, you guys are going to write me off. Yeah, you guys are going to, you guys are going to write me off. Then I'm going to go and study at the best. And so I was studying and, um, and, you know, I wasn't full of like, I'm going to be, I'm going to make it. It was just be at soak up as much as you can learn here and learn how to put on a production and then who knows what you're going to do with it back at home but the point was to say that i was a stella adler student do you know what i'm saying yeah and so take me seriously stop writing me off and i really thought that that i was going to come back and all my problems were going to be resolved but it's just like no you know that's impressive but that's not all there is to having a career in acting. And I think that's what even made me, I thought it was gonna help me out with my film and television career, having that on my resume. No, it didn't. And I think that's what even pushed me to progress even further away from film and television and more into theater. Um, It made me resent, it made me resent my industry even more and pushed me into the artistry of it. So it pushed me towards being more of a theater nerd than wanting to have an acting famous career, you know? I don't know, it started this obsession with me with just wanting to work on good good plays and good productions and less and less about constantly being rejected and saying, you know, you don't fit in this role, but you did before you came out as a disabled actress. Well, I think I just found more of my home. It's a transition I want to talk about here. And uh, Mm. I apologize if I'm getting it. I apologize if I'm going to sound very inconsiderate when I ask this question. I I just, I don't, I don't know the proper uh, phrasing to ask this question, but uh, the coming out as a disabled actor, actress, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did you do this during your time in New York? And if so, or if not, did it hinder your ability to get auditions? Do you believe that you were a disabled actress in New York? New York, I was just studying. L.A. was when I started auditioning. Okay. So you never auditioned for anything in New York? No, I auditioned for the school. I auditioned for the school, but that's about it. No. So when you auditioned for the school, were you out as a disabled actress? Not really. Oh did my you, God. Did you know, I know. Did you know at the what? time that you were, you had this disability? Did I, did I, did I? No, oh my God. I was still kind of like ashamed of it because we would be in movement and my body would just be burning, burning from seizing hot pain. Cause I was not on any meds or anything. And so we had to do all of these theater exercises. And so I still really was kind of like marginalized. And I still was like, why are you bothering? Why are you trying? You can't even keep up in school. So yeah. I was very disillusioned. Oh yeah, I kind of broke my heart a lot. But at the same time, I just enjoyed it so much. Am I a martyr? I don't know. Ask me again. I will ask you again in a few years. (laughs) You're so mean. But the question I have to ask you though is, if you could do it again, and be open and honest with the people at the school, would you have been? Yes. Do you think you would have gotten the same opportunity as you did if they didn't know? Yes, I actually do. Okay. I actually, with the schools, yes. Yes. With the industry? Really? Mm -hmm. Well, because I'm proof of the pudding. Right before I went to New York, right? 
that I was eight. Okay. So three years earlier, I was like, I can't stand lying about my disease anymore. Like I look nuts. I was emaciated. I looked disgusting. I was not booking anything and I wasn't getting auditions. Like sometimes I would work as a receptionist at my agency in Toronto. And I was like, why can't you send me out for this? It's like the breakdown. I remember it completely. Chris was literally blonde hair, very obscure, not your regular beauty. Like they were saying, in other words, she's ugly. Right. And like, we still haven't found, we still haven't found our protagonist. I was like, I can act. I know I can act. Send me out for this. And they just would not send me out for it. Like, come on, man, just like take a chance on me. Um, And so when I was 18, I couldn't stand scenarios like that anymore. And I was like, I have rheumatoid arthritis. And my agents were like, thank God, we knew something was wrong. You're so emaciated, your bones and thin rag and bones. And, and after I did come out of the closet of illness, the agent's assistant, um, <laughs> my agent, Sandy and Yannick had not been brought on yet. So they weren't there and I was working there um, doing something. And um, that this assistant, like at the time my agent was going through some other personal stuff that I, I will not talk about. And her assistant was running the shop and I was talking to her and I was like, well, why can't you exactly? Why can't you send me out on auditions? Like I, I know I'm not like the main protagonist, like the ingenue, but like send me out for like the quirky sidekick and stuff. And she basically said, Lisa, you have a really good um, career in voice but I think you need to be realistic. I hate these the way, and I knew right away where she was going with this conversation. She's like, I think you need to be realistic and accept that you have a great voice portfolio, but you will no longer be sent out or, um, or cast in television and film. And I was just gobsmacked. Like if that was me today, I would have just like gone to town with her and like brought up facts and statistics of why it's good to employ people of different abilities and different colors and different orientations. But back then I didn't have that, the backbone that I had now. Um, And so I just carried that with me to New York. I never really thought, wow, you're bringing up, you're doing this again to me. You're bringing up everything full circle. Everything's everything in my life is making sense. <laughs> I'm glad um, I could be your psychiatrist for free. That's what I was going to say. I was like, uh, can we do this on a weekly basis? <laughs> and then when I was seven. <laughs> um, but before yeah, we go, in, before think, we yeah. before we move into our next uh, segment here, we are going to pause it here because this is going to be the end of part three with Lisa Jai. And it we will be that long. It's been 45 minutes. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associate.